very much. This, this is the one with the vodka in, right? How you doing? It's great that so many people have turned out. I, I, I tend to sort of drift across the board on these things. I, 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 normally if people are filming they, me, they, they sort of put bags to try and make me stop walking around. So I apologise if I kind of do the whole, because you're not supposed to do that in a presentation apparently. Um, thanks so much for inviting me to come tonight. Absolutely brilliant that we're doing this. Uh, I mean, these kind of communities of, of sort of practice and, and, and academia, I think, are, are hugely important. Um, and it's very exciting that you're doing that. And, and, and also great to see so many people here. Very, so I hope this isn't the, uh, the, 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 the last one of these that you're going to do. Um, I, I, uh, j just a little bit about me. I, I spent 10 years in industry before I came into academia. So hopefully tonight you're going to get a, quite a practical insight with a little bit of, uh, of academia and, and a little bit of research sort of thrown in there. Um, and I always like to get the professor on there, he kind of makes mum and dad feel proud and uh, you know the investment really paid off so we're all pretty excited about that. And uh, so without further ado, I understand you're pretty tight on timeline so I understand people are going to start throwing stuff at around 30 minutes so uh, I, need to, I need to get on with this. So that's me, this is what we're going to talk about. Um, that really is an old picture so sorry, sorry about that. Um, what, what, what do we mean when we say marketing? Um, and, and, and this is kind of one of my personal hobby horses. If we're going to talk about what the future of marketing is, we have to really kind of get some common terms. We have to understand uh, what, 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 we're, what we're actually talking about. And I think, I think that goes way back to Aristotle. So it's important to get that out there. Where are we now? It's a good place to start. I mean, I'm doing some work at the moment with an organisational historian and they're pretty groovy people. But um, they, they argue that by looking at the history of organisations, you can kind of project the future. And, and there's some truth to that. But I thought, well, you know, I've got 30 minutes. Let's just start where we are now and we'll, we'll, we'll go forward from there, okay? And where are we going, Marketing 2020? If I don't get to this, then it really has been a waste of time me being here. So uh, hopefully I'll cover this, but you know, who knows? Let's see how it goes, yeah? Um, right, let's go. Now, I just want to get, I, wanna, I really want to get something out there. It's kind of a cathartic evening for me. I am a strategist, okay? So I believe in, 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 in the, the power, the impactfulness of, of strategy. And I'm also a, a sort of a marketing evangelist. So I want to get that out there before the next few slides. Because it's going to go downhill a little bit from here, I'm not going to lie to you. Okay? But I wanted to get this out there because so many of the businesses that I talk to, and we do, we do quite a lot of sort of pseudo consultancy work over at Aston, it, they, they, they confuse, and it, Martin touched on this, they kind of confuse marketing and advertising. And I hate that, it really annoys me. It annoys the heck out of me and, 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 and uh, you see what I want to get out? Get it out. It's really kind of embedded. Um, but I thought I would use the, the, the sort of the AMA. I, I, I'm doing a bit of work with these guys at the moment. They're probably the largest um, marketing sort of trade body membership group on the planet. Um, anybody that isn't aware of their work and, and you're into marketing, I suggest you log on because they do some really cool stuff. Um, but I thought, you know, it's nice to get a definition out there and then juxtapose that with this, this kind of advertising piece down here. And I, I, don't, I'm, I don't really know a lot about advertising. Uh, when, I, when I was in marketing, I used to pay people to be creative on my behalf. So this isn't really my area. But this is, um, this is taken from the IPA, the Institute of Practitioners Advertising website. So they, they, I think, know a little bit about advertising. But the, the, the takeaway from this, and I, I, I'm not sort of making a judgment call on what's more or less important. I'm just saying these things are different. So if you look at a definition of marketing, cheers. Uh, marketing is the activity, set of institutions and processes for creating, communicating, delivering, and exchanging offerings that have a value for customers, clients, partners, and societies at large. This is a big thing. This is not kind of a small tactical piece. This is a cultural thing. This is embedded in the organization. This stuff's important. This matters. Yeah, and as a strategist and somebody who's worked with some pretty large businesses, I've seen this stuff work. So you get this right and other stuff happens, you know, good things happen. This piece here, and I mean, Jeremy Bullmore, he's a director at WPP, largest marketing services company in the world. He, I guess he knows a little bit about this. David Ogilvy, I'm guessing he knows a lot about it. He's certainly the father of advertising, apparently, if you look at the website. Um, he's not around anymore. Um, advertising is paid for communication overtly intended to inform and or influence one or more people. I mean, I have a problem with that. But my point is when you look at this and you look at, I do not regard advertising as entertainment or an art form. Some may disagree. Um, but as a medium of information. So this is a medium of information. This is more about comms. My point is these things, advertising, are definitely not these things. They're different. Marketing is a big strategic thing. Yeah, it's embedded, it's cultural, depending on who you read. 
Um, this is more, it's, I'm not saying it's important. I don't want people to get the impression that I'm having a go at advertising because I know there's some advertisers in the room. I want to get out of here alive and get home to the family tonight. This is important, but my point is it's different. Yeah, this, this is an important part of this, but it's definitely not that. Does that make sense? Get a few of these, nobody's run out of the room yet, so we're doing good. Lock the doors. Okay, now, I, and again, I just want to make sure, I, I want you to be, be, be very clear that I'm here. For me, marketing is a big thing. It's about leading businesses. It's about owning the customer interface. It's about understanding the value creation process. Pretty much what Martin was talking about. It's not a small thing, yeah? This is part of it, but it's not the other stuff. Right, now here are the challenges for the marketing students in the room and possibly some of the practitioners as well. Marketing is dead. Now the first person that I could find said that was Saatchi. Saatchi was saying this three or four years ago, marketing is dead. So you must feel pretty happy that you took a marketing degree, right? <laughs> There's no one broken, broken out in tears yet, but you know, don't worry, well, you know, we'll, 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 I'm working on it, I'm working on it. Marketing is to blame for the lack of trust in banks. So it's, hey, it's not that, this wouldn't be the bankers. Let's be very clear on this. This isn't the accountants or the finances. It's marketing's fault, okay? We need to own that, okay? Marketing has lost its seat at the board table. And that's actually true. You do some analysis, say, say you take top 200, look at some FTSE companies. Not that many with marketing in the title. It really isn't. There's probably about 15, 20%, maybe. And then, and then, you know, I have to put up with these kind of things, you know, dinner parties. Ah, you're in marketing, aren't you? You should, uh, look at this. <laughs> we can't compete on price. We also can't compete on quality feature or service. That leaves fraud, which I'd like you to call marketing. That's great. You know, I'm feeling really good about the profession right now, yeah? And also, unbelievably, we've been, we've been blamed for consumerism. It's our fault. Yeah, so the massive wedges of debt that people are roaming the countryside with, that's our fault. We own that, right? Nothing to do with the financiers. Okay. And these are, by the way, these aren't people's just opinions. This isn't Dave from Cheltenham that's rung up the BBC and said, hey, this is what I think today. This is, these, are, these are credible sources. This is Forbes, this is marketing, this is Harvard Business Review. Great article in Harvard Business Review about marketing is dead, by the way, you should read it. Um, also as well, also as well, it's not just the practice side. Marketing academics are great at beating ourselves up. We're wonderful at it. I mean, there's a whole sort of area I could get into here and I'd really start to, you'd feel really sorry for me, but uh, marketing academics are very, very good at beating themselves up. It is, it is incredibly hard nowadays to get published in, in, in sort of four, four star, three star journals. Um, that you have to have multiple data sets, multiple respondents, multiple, multiple data sets, and then you've got to retest it. Then you go through five or six, I've lost one. Oh no, don't go, don't go. <laughs> This happens all the time to me. I'm never going to do one of these again. That's it. It always happens to me. Um, literally, I was on for five minutes. I'm talking. I've lost one already. I believe this. Always happens. Yeah, so, so you, you, in, in marketing academia, you've kind of got this sort of fractionalization. People are breaking out into silos. And you've got to remember, marketing sprang from economics in the 50s and 60s. We used to have big economic debates about the impact of marketing on society. You don't really see that nowadays. But we've, we've kind of, you look at the PhDs coming out of the States. I'm involved in a couple of them. Um, probably 80%, 80% consumer behavior, digital. Uh, probably 80% at least. It's mainly CB, mainly digital. There, there's, there's some other stuff in there. But the strategic piece, you remember the bit I'm passionate about? There could be a link here. This is a very, very small slice. Very, very small slice. So even in academia, we're kind of beating ourselves up a bit. We, we're kind of almost stampeding towards the tactical, which, which kind of worries me a little bit. Wow, that's strong. Okay. Still with me? Good. Okay. Um, yeah, so we've not only got the practice piece, hey, you know, marketing stinks, you guys are a bunch of losers. Uh, we've also got academics saying, well, you know what? You know what? Strategy piece is missing. There's been, some, there's been a couple of nice contributions in the Journal of Marketing lately, probably in the last five years, that have actually said this overtly. They've kind of summarised this stuff on the left and they've said, hey, you know what, marketing has lost its seat at the board table. 
the, the, the chief marketing officer is, is starting to get distance from the real decisions. We're not owning these decisions. We're not owning the customer interface. Yeah, and also as well, and again, I'm going to say this because I'm an academic, not that much kind of strategy in the research. A lot of CB, a lot of digital, a lot of other stuff, but not, not really a lot of you know, traditional hardcore strategic. That said, that said, we've just been successful in getting a special issue editorial of the European Journal of Marketing, so you should all submit a paper. Very happy about that. I can see you all, a lot of energy in the room. Um, so my point is we have some challenges. Now, off the back, somebody passed out. <laughs> Okay, so we've lost two and somebody's passed out. Okay. Um, actually, this is going quite well. It's going quite well. It's normally a lot worse than this. Um, okay, so off the, back, off the back of the marketing is dead piece in HBR, they cite this, they cite, they cite this study from the Fournay's marketing group. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, guys, it's not any more good news. Um, yeah. 80% um, of CEOs don't really trust and are not very impressed by the work of marketers. I mean, that's kind of, that's pretty damning. I mean, the, how do you think that's going to go? You know, you're, you're the CEO, you don't trust these guys. They're on your board, by the way, or probably not. You don't trust these guys and you're not very impressed. So in, 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 in a downturn, in tough economic times, you're going to give these guys more money? You're probably not. You, you're probably, I mean, what's the first thing that gets cut in a downturn? HR, marketing, then we start delayering, right? Hate that term. But we start delayering, right? So, and, and, and why is that? I mean, I, I, I did one of these talks probably just before, just before Christmas, time goes quick. And I was sort of talking about this and saying, well, you know, hey, why, why do you think this is? You know, what, why do you think that these budgets get cut? And, and, you know, do you think it's about the accountability piece? Do you think it's because CEOs don't kind of understand this and they don't trust them? And two kind of, uh, I think they were ad agency guys, sorry about this. They came up and they sort of had a pokey moment and, they go, and, and the people, you, you can tell when people are annoyed at you because they always start the sentence the same way. You academics. <laughs> this is a bad conversation. You academics. You think, okay, I'm, I've, I clearly have said something wrong. You academics don't understand. Oh, okay, probably not. There's a lot of stuff I don't understand, clearly. Um, well, you know, the, the budget isn't ours to own. The, the CEO can just decide to chop 20% of my budget and I've just got to suck it up. And I said, well, that's interesting. So, so presumably the 20% that you lost you went back to him and said, hey, totally appreciate you're going to cut this 20%. This is your budget. You, com you completely own that. You do realise that by chopping this 20% out, you're going to lose A, B and C. So it's likely that leads are going to be down X next year. That equates to this kind of conversion rate. That, that's this in terms of sales. You know that, right? Suddenly went really quiet. Oh, no, uh, we, 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 we don't really do that. Okay, interesting. So, so you, you pres presumably there's kind of some number that you can put on this for the CEO, right? So you've got to play it back and say, hey, you've cut our budget, you're going to lose this. Yeah, we don't really kind of do that. Okay, well, suck it up, Buttercup. I mean, if you can't, you know, if, if you can't justify your, uh, if you can't justify your expenditure, why should he understand? He's not a marketer. That's your job. Okay, so... 69, let's get the next one. 69% of B2C CEOs believe that marketers focus too much on their creative and social media bubble. I love that. I mean, that tells a story. Their bubble. I mean, they clearly just don't get it. I mean, they have no idea. And also, why should they? Why should they? I, I mean, you know, finance people run a lot of these uh, big companies. Um, accountants run a lot of them. They don't understand it any more than they maybe understand, I don't know, IT or logistics you yeah, know why should they but but they have to the, the the job is ownership it's your job to kind of influence this and say hey we are valuable we, we, we create value but clearly this isn't happening and also you know in an age where and you kind of touched on this martin in an age where you can buy likes i mean you know you just bring this call center somewhere and say yeah, I'd like 500 likes tomorrow i mean for me that currency is devalued and i don't really know a lot about this space yeah 75% of CEOs believe marketers do not adequately speak the language of top management. Well, you know, we, we see this in the data. You know, you look at the FTSE 100, very few marketing people. I mean, I'm sure they have good marketing people second level. But my point is the strategic piece is, is missing. Yeah, the marketers aren't doing a good enough job. And, and you know, you, I, th I think you're absolutely spot on at, at sort of capturing the value that we create. And the value is huge. And playing that into companies and saying, look what we do. This is central, this is important. It's not just advertising. 
And again, I make no comment on advertising. Advertising is hugely important for the advertisers in the room. But it has to be, the marketing has to be more than, hey, red's a fast colour and our brochure should be red. Yeah, or, you know, let's have a big Pantone cake about this. You know, we have to, we have to be able to justify the value we create. Otherwise, we're going to go the way of the dodo. So, I was quite interested in this a few years ago, because coming from practice, I'd kind of got a few preconceptions. But um, at the time when I sort of segued into Aston, they were coming to end of a rather large piece of, of global research. And believe it or not, 18,000 respondents from across the planet. I think 15 countries were involved. It was, it was kind of Graham Hooley and John Saunders, those guys. And, and I, I kind of segued into the UK piece at the end. Um, millions of, of academic publications from it, yada, yada, yada. And uh, we're starting to go back into some of the interview data now, because a lot of interview data sort of was a precursor to the big quant studies. And uh, we've had some RAs poking around in that. What, what this is a representation of, and it's not, um, I'm not, I don't think we're going to get this published anytime soon, but I, th I thought it was useful for today. Um, is these are the symptoms that we see in the interviews conducted in low performing businesses. So these are businesses that perform way below the sector. Okay. And again, they're, they're not grouped in any particular clever way. This is just some stuff that I thought was interesting for tonight. It was a big sample, and also it's not just a UK thing. We, 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 other than China, this data is replicated right across the piece. It's quite incredible. I mean, we, we didn't, we always saw no variants. Um, so marketing, in, in the, remember these are low performing businesses in their sectors. So marketing is advertising or communications. Yeah, the, the strategic piece is just completely missing in these organisations. It, it, marketing is synonymous with advertising and it, it, is, it, it has no strategic value in these organisations. Um, so the strategic piece is completely missing. There's no idea of what value do we create for some segments. It's just, you know, we're kind of in business. We will pretty much sell, any, we will sell anything we do to anyone that can make fog on a mirror. Literally. And we'll probably do it on price. Um, little measurement or reporting of marketing activity. The budgets weren't necessarily large in these organisations, but there wasn't any kind of, you know, hey, this is what we do with this. You know, th this, is, this is why we spend this here as opposed to this here. Or, or you know, um, we've made some choices this year and we're not going to go with that because the data tells us not to. There was very little of this. There was virtually no discussion. It was almost kind of, hey, marketing is 5% of sales and it will be forever until the world ends. Yeah, th there was very little kind of um, strategic discussion. Um, and there was a ritualisation of customer information. So, so, you know what? All of these very low performing businesses had great satisfaction scores. It's amazing. We looked at these, and they, these guys really sucked, I mean, across the planet. And they all collected customer data, and they all had really nice satisfaction indices because they gamed the system. They kind of got the system down to a fine art that the person in charge of uh, collecting the satisfaction scores wasn't going to get fired because they'd taken out all the questions that might reduce the score. How useful is that? <laughs> I mean, that's really making, a, that's making an impact, right? And then every month, you know, or every quarter, these guys sit down and say, hey, guess what? Our satisfaction score went up by 0.1. And everyone goes, it's very cool. Anyway, let's talk about the balance sheet. There's no, you know, it's not, it's not meaning, it's not doing anything. It's just kind of stuff. You, you would be better off sacking everybody in that department and sticking it on the bottom line. It, it, does, it provides no value for you. Um, big difference between what we say and what we do. I'm just aware of the time. Um, you know, they kind of, a lot of these companies were, hey, you know, they got the brass plaque and everybody polished this and we love our customers and we love our employees and we'll do anything to make you happy. And I mean, it just wasn't the case. They, 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 there was, they, they, they basically didn't do that. They were incredibly inauthentic. And it's all about price. This was the big one. In, in, in all of the low performing businesses, their value creation was based on price. So it is, I mean, I, you know, hey, things have been pretty grim lately, and in mean, a lot of industries it has been about price, but not all, and certainly not in high-performing businesses. High-performing businesses create value in different ways. I was talking to a guy, um, I better not name the brand because I probably, I don't know whether I'll get sued or whatever, I don't know. But um, this, is, this was like a sort of 60 million pound business. Uh, they were manufacturing largely, and they chose to sort of go into a more service-oriented approach. No one else was doing this, changed the industry. In two years, they went from a 50 million pound business, 60 million pound business to a 500 million pound business. 
and they originally sold on price. And what they recognised was that we can't take any more costs out of this, this logistics chain. We can't take any more costs. We, we're down to the bone. We have to do this differently. And they changed the industry. Everybody else is trying to follow them now. So, and, and the biggest one for me, they had no clear view about why customers buy from them. They had no idea. Literally, no idea. Pete, we do stuff, we open the door, people give us money, I don't know. It's kind of cool. Um, you know, and of course in a downturn, I mean, what, the first thing that happens, oh, why are they all leaving us? I don't know. We have no idea why they bought from us in the first place. Why, how would we know that, that, why, why they're leaving us? So yeah, that was, the, that was the big scary one for me. I mean, that was, that was pretty horrendous. And, and I think it tells a tale. I, at this point, I just thought, let's bring it in. Come on. <laughs> come on, I love marketing, come on. No? See that? Come on, come on, come on, bring it down. Come on, babe. Come on. Come on, I love marketing, come on. You're, you're, you're into it, yeah, come on, yeah. That's the good stuff. That's the good stuff right there. And that's why I'm in marketing. That's why, that's why I'm still in marketing. Oh, my God. Um, okay, so, so in closing, look, you know, looking forward, okay, let's sum up where marketing's going for the next few years in like six minutes. Help. Um, I think I, I, we, we've been talking about this forever. The return on marketing investment, the Romy piece, it, it's, we've been talking about this forever, but we're still, we're still unable to, to get a seat at the top table. So we have to be able to, to get hold of this and justify the value that we create, not just, not just internally. You know, that we, that we, we convince the, the, the decision makers that we are valuable and influential and you know, this, the owning the customer sort of interface piece, but also external, you know, external stakeholders. Martin talked about this. Industries are going to be hugely fast-paced. The rate of change in these industries is going to increase incrementally. You, you know, I mean, just, just exponentially, it's going to go through the roof. So, so we have to be able to sort of re constantly reevaluate re the value proposition. What is our value, value proposition? Is it still relevant? And definitely in the sales space as well, this is going to be so important to be able to do that. Um, in terms of the organisational, so what are people going to have to do who fit in organisations? Because academics tend to talk about organisations. Organisations behave in this way. Organisations just building with people running around them. So this is people we're talking about. People are going to have to behave in this way. But organisations are going to have to try and be more innovative, flexible and adaptable and agile. We can't do this alone, guys. This is not a marketing thing. The best change programmes that I've been involved in of late have been across different areas. This silo mentality that we are kind of island marketing, absolutely for the birds. We, you, you know, the, the best change programmes I've been involved in have been with HR because you're changing people's behavior. If you just send an email out tomorrow saying, hey guys, as of tomorrow, we're all customer focused, right? Love the management. I mean, how do you think that's gonna go? Nobody's gonna change. It's, it's more systemic than that. And also, people don't necessarily wanna change. Some people, you gotta make them change. And that's a whole different lecture, by the way. Um, okay, data and technology are gonna be massive. I was, I was reading some, some stuff on this internet of things the other day. Basically, I mean, that could be crazy. I don't remember the term, but somebody was likening it to, if you imagine the data that's on the web right now, you could basically make that into books, and it would stretch from, um, uh oh, <laughs> it was it was stretch from, be really quick, really quick, um, it was stretched from here to Pluto. And the problem with big data is, and I mean the the, 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 the researchers in the room will know this, bigger the data set, you start to get more and more significant relationships. So if you don't have a theory or some kind of hypothesis, you will find a relationship. You will say, hey, who knew? We have a relationship between amount of toilets cleaned in Brazil and birth rates in Hong Kong. How, how does, let's figure that one out. Let's try and create a product that works around that. I mean, it's nuts. You, but but in, if you, you get the data set big enough, you'll find something. So you have to have some kind of hypothesis, some kind of theory. I hate, hate to use the H word, especially with practitioners in the room, but you have to have some kind of theory, right? Um, and we have to own the customer and market interface, otherwise other people will. Yeah, it will, it, it will get backed into logistics. Logistics will own the customer interface there and be influential in the strategic piece. Sales are likely to own the strategic piece, and in many organizations already do. They own the customer, the, the customer interaction, they own that piece. Yeah, and it should be marketing. It should be marketing. So we have to be able to do that, and we can't do it on our own. And um, also, authenticity, integrity, and trust. At one point, marketing, and I think we're still kind of shaking this off, 
we see it as almost kind of smoke and mirrors. You know, what was it? Uh, you sell the, sell the dream and live the nightmare. Yeah? Well, you know, in, 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 in an age where more and more people are looking for, to, 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 to consumers for opinion, yeah? See, we're looking on the web for opinion. We're not looking at the, at the company. You touched on this, Martin. We're looking, at, we're looking at other consumers to inform our opinion. You have to have an authentic product because you won't be able to create the smoke and mirrors. That, that, the, the, the longevity of that will, it just won't last. It'll be eroded really quickly because everybody that buys your product is saying, you suck. Yeah? So, so, and again, I've had these conversations in boardroom. It's fine for us to believe. We can all sit around and have our big you know, vision and mission pie and we love our customers and everything's cool. The market will decide. If we're not authentic and we cannot build trust, and we can't identify the value we create and, and, and push this out into specific segments, you're dead. It doesn't matter how much you believe, it's the market will decide. So this authenticity and integrity and trust piece is so important. In closing, kind of finally, finally, I'm over, right? I'm good. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for not throwing anything as well. Um, you, you've got to be able to think strategically. Yeah, and have a plan. I mean, I, this sounds really twee, right? But nothing, nothing I've talked about tonight, particularly, is revolutionary or groundbreaking at all. What, what are we talking about? We're talking about being able to identify value. Now, the pace of change is going to be quick, this is for sure. But, but a lot of these are really basic ideas. What value do you create? Who are you going to sell it to? What segments? What segments are you going to operate in? These are terms that you guys are going to know, yeah? Um, you know, where's your position in the market? These things are going to change very quickly, but these aren't revolutionary terms. But it appears, for many organisations, it is. Yeah? So I think, for me, and again, I am, I am a strategist, um, we've got to recapture that space. Marketing can be transformational if it's embedded correctly. We have to own the data flows and the customer interface, and in that way, we can, we can influence the other areas of the business, not wait for the people to decide what our budget's going to be this year. Or how many people you're going to have to get rid of in the marketing department next year. Because they won't be able to, because the value creation will be embedded in the organisation. And that's exactly how it should be. How do you do this? And I realise I'm out of time. This is my last point. This is my last point. Um, I think kind of what, we, what we're seeing tonight, that these, these communities of, of, of practice and academia are so important. Now, in the US, they're massive. There's an excellent sales centre that I've done some work with in Houston. Um, and that's really where all the sales work's coming out of now in the States. A guy called Mike Ahern pretty much owns that space. And the connectivity with business and academia and good rigorous research is, I mean, it's almost hand in glove. And in the UK, we've always been a little bit suspicious. Academics have always been boffins, right? They're people who are, who are kind of divorced from practice. And they're not. They're not. I mean, I mean, having been in academia, you know, yeah, okay, we've got some personalities in academia, but, you know, we've got some great skills that can be really helpful. And, and, and these kind of ideas where we connect practice with research can really, really help. And they can be self-fulfilling self communities. That there are mutual benefits all over the place. Um, we also remember Occupy a space in marketing that is, that is populated by unqualified practice. And I hate this, because every time I talk to my HR friends, they're like, yeah, CIP, they can't get employed without that. And my SEMA colleagues and my chartered accountant colleagues, they, they, can't, they can't get a job with their qualifications. Pretty much anybody that can make fog on a mirror can get a marketing job. And that's wrong. That is wrong. Because at the time when people are getting made redundant, and these are people with families and mortgages, it is not good enough to say marketing is some kind of dark art and divine right. It's not good enough. So I think more qualified practice, more accountability. And also, and I, I, didn't, think, I didn't think I would invoke the spirit of... Uh, Sir John Harvey Jones tonight. But he kind of, for me, summarises where we are. Because a lot of these organisations that don't have these things, they, they don't necessarily get the time to just step away from the business and think strategically. They spend all their time doing. Um, done some work recently with a company that turns over probably two and a half billion. They're a global organisation. They they're only just starting to do this. They spend all their time doing and very little time thinking. And it's so important. And, and marketing can, can own that space. But, in the spirit of that, this guy was the original troubleshooter. Planning is an unnatural process. It's much more fun to do something, right? The nicest thing about not planning is that failure comes as a complete surprise rather than being preceded by a period of worry, worry and depression. <laughs> I'll leave you with that thought. Thank you. <laughs>